I'm an organic food eating, carbon footprint minimizing, robotic surgery geek. And I really want to build green. But I'm very suspicious of all of these well-meaning articles, people long on moral authority and short on data telling me how to do these kinds of things. And so I have to figure this out for myself. For example, is this evil? I have dropped a blob of organic yogurt from happy self-actualized local cows on my countertop, and I grab a paper towel and I want to wipe it up. But can I use a paper towel? The answer to this can be found in embodied energy. This is the amount of energy that goes into any paper towel or embodied water. And every time I use a paper towel, I am using this much virtual energy and water. Wipe it up, throw it away. Now, if I compare that to a cotton towel that I can use a thousand times, I don't have a whole lot of embodied energy until I wash that yogurty towel. This is now operating energy. So if I throw my towel in the washing machine, I've now put energy and water back into that towel. Unless I use a front-loading, high-efficiency washing machine, and then it looks a little bit better. But what about a recycled paper towel that comes in those little half sheets? Well, now paper towel looks better. Screw the paper towels. Let's go to a sponge. I wipe it up with a sponge, and I put it under the running water, and I have a lot less energy and a lot more water unless you're like me and you leave the handle in the position of the hot even when you turn it on, and then you start to use more energy. Or worse, you let it run until it's warm to rinse out your towel. And now all bets are off. <laughs> so what this says is that sometimes the things that you least expect, the position in which you put the handle, have a bigger effect than any of those other things that you were trying to optimize. Now imagine someone as twisted as me trying to build a house. So. <laughs> The, that's what my husband and I are doing right now. And so we wanted to know how green could we be. And there's a thousand and one articles out there telling us how to make all these green trade-offs. And they are just as suspect and telling us to optimize these little things around the edges and missing the elephant in the living room. Now the average house has about 300 megawatt hours of embodied energy in it. This is the energy it takes to make it millions and millions of paper towels. We wanted to know how much better we could do. And so, like many people, we start with a house on a lot, and I'm gonna show you typical construction on the top and what we're doing on the bottom. So first we demolish it, take some energy, but if you deconstruct it, you take it all apart, you use the bits, you can get some of that energy back. We then dug a big hole to put in a rainwater catchment tank to take our yard water independent. And then we poured a big foundation for passive solar. Now you can reduce the uh, embodied energy by about 25% by using high fly ash concrete. We then put in framing. And so this is framing lumber, uh, composite materials. And it's kind of hard to get the embodied energy out of that, but it can be a sustainable resource if you use FSC certified lumber. We then go on to the first thing that was very surprising. If we put aluminum windows in this house, we would double the energy use right there. Now, PVC is a little bit better, but still not as good as the wood that we chose. We then put in plumbing, electrical, and HVAC, and insulate. Now, spray foam is an excellent insulator. It fills in all of the cracks, but it is pretty high embodied energy. And sprayed in cellulose or blue jeans is a much lower energy alternative to that. We also used straw bale infill for our library, which has zero embodied energy. When it comes time to sheetrock, if you use echo rock, it's about a quarter of the embodied energy of standard sheetrock. And then you get to finishes, the subjects of all of those go green articles. And on the scale of a house, they almost make no difference at all, and yet all the press is focused on that, except for flooring. If you put carpeting in your house, it's about a tenth of the embodied energy of the entire house, unless you use concrete or wood for a much lower embodied energy. So now we add in the final construction energy, we add it all up, and we've built a house for less than half of the typical embodied energy for building a house like this. But before we pat ourselves too much on the back, we have poured 151 megawatt hours of energy into constructing this house when there was a house there before. And so the question is, how could we make that back? And so if I run my new energy efficient house forward compared to the old non-energy efficient house, we make it back in about six years. 
Now, I probably would have upgraded the old house to be more energy efficient, and if that case, um, it would take me more about 20 years to break even. If I <laughs> Now, if I hadn't paid attention to embodied energy, it would have taken us over 50 years to break even compared to the upgraded house. So what does this mean? On the scale of my portion of the house, this is equivalent to about as much as I drive in a year. It's about five times as much as if I went entirely vegetarian, but my elephant in the living room flies. Clearly, I need to walk home from Ted. <laughs> but all the calculations for embodied energy are on the blog, and remember, it's sometimes the things that you are not expecting to be the biggest changes that are. Thank you. Some 17 years ago, I became allergic to Delhi's air. My doctors told me that my lung capacity had gone down to 70%, and it was killing me. With the help of IIT, Terry, and learnings from NASA, we discovered that there are three basic green plants, common green plants, with which we can grow all the fresh air we need indoors to keep us healthy. We've also found that you can reduce the fresh air requirements into the building while maintaining industry indoor air quality standards. The three plants are Arika palm, Madan Law's tongue, and money plant. The botanical names are in front of you. Arika palm is a plant which removes CO2 and converts it into oxygen. We need four shoulder high plants per person, and in terms of plant care, we need to wipe the leaves every day in Delhi and perhaps once a week in cleaner air cities. We have to grow them in vermi manure, which is sterile or hydroponics, and take them outdoors every three to four months. The second plant is mother-in-law's tongue, which is again a very common plant, and we call it a bedroom plant because it converts CO2 into oxygen at night. And we need six to eight waist-high plants per person. The third plant is money plant, and this is again a very common plant, preferably grows in hydroponics. And this particular plant removes formaldehydes and other volatile chemicals. With these three plants, you can grow all the fresh air you need. In fact, you could be in a bottle with a cap on top and you would not die at all and you would not need any fresh air. We have tried these plants at our own building in Delhi which is a 50,000 square feet, 20-year-old building, and it has close to 1,200 such plants for 300 occupants. Our studies have found that there is a 42% probability of one's blood oxygen going up by 1% if one stays indoors in this building for 10 hours. The government of India has discovered or published a study to show that this is the healthiest building in New Delhi. And the studies show that there is a Compared to other buildings, there is a reduced incidence of eye irritation by 52%, respiratory systems by 34%, headaches by 24%, lung impairment by 12%, and asthma by 9%. And this study has been published on September 8, 2008, and it's available on the Government of India website. Our experience points to an amazing increase in human productivity by over 20% by using these plants and also a reduction in energy requirements in buildings by an outstanding 15% because you need less fresh air. We are now replicating this in a 1.75 million square feet building, which will have 60,000 indoor plants. Why is this important? It is also important for environment because the world's energy requirements are expected to grow by 30% in the next decade. 
40% of the world's energy is taken up by buildings currently, and 60% of the world's population will be living in buildings in, in cities with a population of over 1 million in the next 15 years. And there is a growing preference for living and working in air-conditioned spaces. Be the change you want to see in the world, said Mahatma Gandhi, and thank you for listening. buildings today have something in common. They're made using Victorian technologies. This involves blueprints, industrial manufacturing and construction using teams of workers. All of this effort results in an inert object and that means that there's a one-way transfer of energy from our environment into our homes and cities. This is not sustainable. I believe that the only way that it is possible for us to construct genuinely sustainable homes and cities is by connecting them to nature, not insulating them from it. Now, in order to do this, we need the right kind of language. Living systems are in constant conversation with the natural world through sets of chemical reactions called metabolism. And this is the conversion of one group of substances into another, either through the production or the absorption of energy. And this is the way in which um, living materials make the most of um, their local resources in a sustainable way. So I'm interested in the use of metabolic materials for the practice of architecture. But they don't exist, so I'm having to make them. I'm working with architect Neil Spiller at the Bartlett School of Architecture, and we're collaborating with international scientists in order to generate these new materials from a bottom-up approach. That means we're generating them from scratch. One of our um, collaborators is chemist Martin Hanzuk, and he's really interested in the transition from inert to living matter. Now, that's exactly the kind of process that I'm interested in when we're thinking about sustainable materials. So Martin, he works with a system called the protocell. Now all this is, and it's magic, it's a little fatty bag and it's got a chemical battery in it and it has no DNA. This little bag is able to conduct itself in a way that can only be described as living. It is able to move around its environment. It can follow chemical gradients and it can undergo complex reactions, some of which are happily architectural. So here we are. These are protocells patterning their environment. We don't know how they do that yet. Here, this is a protocell, and it's vigorously shedding this skin. Now, this looks like a chemical kind of birth. This is a violent process. Here, we've got a protocell to extract carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and turn it into carbonate, and that's the shell around that globular fat. They're quite brittle, so you've only got a part one there. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to push these technologies towards creating bottom-up construction approaches for architecture, which contrast the current Victorian top-down methods, which impose structure upon matter. That can't be energetically sensible. So bottom-up materials actually exist today. They've been in use um, in architecture since ancient times. If you walk around the city of Oxford, where we are today, and have a look at the brickwork, which I've enjoyed doing in the last couple of days, you'll actually see that a lot of it's made of limestone. And if you look even closer, you'll see in that limestone, there are little shells and little skeletons that are piled upon each other, and then they're fossilised over millions of years. Now, a block of limestone in itself isn't particularly that interesting. It's looks beautiful. Um, but imagine what the properties of this limestone block might be if the surfaces were actually in conversation with the atmosphere. Maybe they could extract carbon dioxide. Would it give this block of limestone new properties? Well, most likely it would. It might be able to grow, it might be able to self-repair, and even respond to dramatic changes in the, in the immediate environment. So, 
Architects are never happy with just one block of an interesting material. They think big. Okay. So when we think about scaling up metabolic materials, we can start thinking about ecological interventions like repair of atolls or reclamation of parts of a city that are damaged by water. So one of these examples would, of course, be the historic city of Venice. Now, Venice, as you know, has a tempestuous relationship with the sea and is built upon wooden piles. So we've devised a way by which it may be possible for the protocell technology that we're working with to sustainably reclaim Venice. An architect, Christian Kerrigan, has come up with a series of designs that show us how it may be possible to actually grow a limestone reef underneath the city. So... Here's the technology we have today. This is our protocell technology effectively making a shell like its limestone forefathers and depositing it in a very complex environment against natural materials. We're looking at crystal lattices to see the bonding processes in this. Now, this is the very interesting part. We don't just want limestone dumped everywhere in all the pretty canals. What we need it to do is to be creatively um, crafted around the wooden piles. So you can see from these diagrams that the protocells actually are moving away from the light towards the dark foundations. We've observed this in the laboratory. The protocells can actually move away from the light. They can actually also move towards the light. You have to just choose your species. So these don't just exist as one entity. We kind of chemically engineer them. And so here the protocells are depositing their limestone very specifically around the foundations of Venice, effectively petrifying it. Now, this isn't going to happen tomorrow. It's going to take a while. It's going to take years of tuning and monitoring this technology in order for us to become ready to test it out on a case-by-case -case basis on the most damaged and stressed um, buildings within the city of Venice. But gradually, as the buildings are repaired, we will see the accretion of a limestone reef beneath the city. And accretion itself is a huge sink of carbon dioxide. Also, it will attract the local marine ecology who will find their own ecological nieces within this architecture. So this is really interesting. Now we have an architecture that connects the city to the natural world in a very direct and immediate way. But perhaps the most exciting thing about it is that the driver of this technology is available everywhere. This is terrestrial chemistry. We've all got it, which means that this technology is just as appropriate for developing countries as it is for first world countries. So in summary, I'm generating metabolic materials as a counterpose to Victorian technologies and building architectures from a bottom-up approach. Secondly, these metabolic materials have some of the properties of living systems, which means they can perform in similar ways. They can expect to have a lot of forms and functions within the practice of architecture. And finally, an observer in the future, marvelling at a beautiful structure in the environment, may find it almost impossible to tell whether this structure has been created by a natural process or an artificial one. Thank you. I'd like to start with a couple of quick examples. These are spinneret glands on the abdomen of a spider. They produce six different types of silk which are spun together into a fiber tougher than any fiber humans have ever made. The nearest we've come is with aramid fiber. And uh, to make that, it involves extremes of temperature, extremes of pressure, and loads of pollution. And yet the spider manages to do it at ambient temperature and pressure with raw materials of dead flies and water. It does suggest we've still got a bit to learn. This beetle can detect a forest fire at 80 kilometers away. That's roughly 10,000 times the range of man-made fire detectors. And what's more, this guy doesn't need a wire connecting it all the way back to a power station burning fossil fuels. So these two examples give a sense of what biomimicry could deliver. If we could learn to make things and do things the way nature does, we could achieve factor 10, factor 100, maybe even factor 1,000 savings in resource and energy use. And if we're to make progress with the sustainability revolution, I believe there are three really big changes we need to bring about. 
Firstly, radical increases in resource efficiency. Secondly, shifting from a linear, wasteful, polluting way of using resources to a closed-loop model. And thirdly, changing from a fossil fuel economy to a solar economy. And for all three of these, I believe biomimicry has a lot of the solutions that we're going to need. You could look at nature as being like a catalogue of products, and all of those have benefited from a 3.8 billion year research and development period. And uh, given that level of investment, it kind of makes sense to use it. So I'm going to talk about some projects that have explored these ideas. And uh, let's start with radical increases in resource efficiency. When we were working on the Eden project, we had to create a, a very large greenhouse in a site that was not only irregular, but it was continually changing because it was still being quarried. It was a hell of a challenge, and uh, it was actually examples from biology that provided a lot of the clues. So, for instance, um, it was soap bubbles that helped us generate a building form that would work regardless of the final ground levels. Studying pollen grains and radiolaria and uh, carbon molecules helped us devise the most efficient structural solution using hexagons and pentagons. The next move was that we wanted to try and maximize the size of those hexagons. And to do that, we had to find an alternative to glass, which is really very limited in terms of its unit sizes. And in nature, there are lots of examples of very efficient structures based on pressurized membranes. So we started exploring this material called ETFE. It's a high-strength polymer. And uh, what you do is you put it together in three layers, you weld it around the edge, and then you inflate it. And the great thing about this stuff was that you could make it in, in units of roughly seven times the size of glass, and um, it was only 1% of the weight of double glazing. So that was a factor 100 saving. And what we found is that we got into a kind of positive cycle in which one breakthrough facilitated another. So with such large, lightweight pillows, uh, we, we had much less steel. With less steel, we were getting more sunlight in which meant we didn't have to put as much extra heat in in winter. And um, with less overall weight in the superstructure, there were big savings in the foundations. And at the end of the project, we worked out that the weight of that superstructure was actually less than the weight of the air inside the building. So I think the Eden Project is a fairly good example of how ideas from biology can lead to radical increases in resource efficiency, delivering the same function, but with a fraction of the resource input. And actually, there are loads of examples in nature that you could turn to for, for similar uh, solutions. So for instance, you could develop super efficient roof structures based on giant Amazon water lilies, whole buildings inspired by abalone shells, super lightweight bridges inspired by plant cells. There's a world of beauty and efficiency to explore here, using nature as a design tool. So now I want to go on to talking about the linear to closed loop idea. The way we tend to use resources is uh, we extract them, we turn them into short life products, and then dispose of them. Nature works very differently. In ecosystems, the waste from one organism becomes the nutrient for something else in that system. And there are some examples of projects that have deliberately uh, tried to mimic ecosystems. And one of my, favorite is, one of my favorites is uh, called the Cardboard to Caviar Project uh, by Graham Wiles. And uh, in their area, they had quite a lot of shops and restaurants that were producing lots of food, cardboard, and plastic waste that was ending up in landfill. Now, the really clever bit is what they did with the cardboard waste. And I'm just going to talk through this uh, with this animation. So they were paid to collect it from the restaurants. They then shredded the cardboard and sold it to equestrian centers as horse bedding. When that was soiled, they were paid again to collect it. They put it into wormery composting systems, which produced a lot of worms, which they fed to Siberian sturgeon, which produced caviar, which they sold back to the restaurants. So it transformed a linear process into a closed-loop model, and it created more value in the process. Graham Wiles has continued to add more and more elements to this, uh, turning waste streams into schemes that create value. And, and just as natural systems tend to increase in diversity and resilience over time, there's a real sense with this project that um, the number of possibilities just continue increasing. And it's, I know it's a quirky example, but I think the, the implications of this are quite radical because it suggests that we could actually transform a big problem, waste, into a massive opportunity. And particularly in cities, you know, we can look at the whole metabolism of cities and look at those as, as opportunities. And that's what we're doing on the next project I'm going to talk about, the Mobius project, where we're trying to bring together a number of activities all within one building so that the, the waste from one can become the nutrient for another. And the kind of elements I'm talking about are, firstly, we have a restaurant inside a productive greenhouse, a bit like this one in Amsterdam, called De Cass. Then we would have an anaerobic digester which could deal with all the biodegradable waste from the local area, turning that into heat for the greenhouse and electricity to feed back into the grid. We'd have a water treatment system, treating wastewater, turning that into fresh water and generating energy from the solids, using just plants and microorganisms. We'd have a fish farm fed with vegetable waste from the kitchen and worms from the compost and supplying fish back to the restaurant. 
And we'd also have a coffee shop, and the waste grains from that could be used as a substrate for growing mushrooms. So you can see that we're bringing together cycles of food, energy, and water, and waste all within one building. And um, just for fun, we've proposed this for a roundabout in central London, which is at the moment is a complete eyesore. Some of you may recognize this. And with just a little bit of replanning, uh, we could transform a space dominated by traffic into one that provides open space for people, reconnects people with food, and transforms waste into closed loop opportunities. So the final project I want to talk about is the Sahara Forest Project, which we're working on at the moment. It may come as a surprise to some of you to hear that quite large areas of what are currently desert were actually forested a fairly short time ago. So, for instance, when Julius Caesar arrived in North Africa, huge areas of North Africa were covered in cedar and cypress forests. And during the evolution of life on the Earth, um, it was the, co the colonization of the land by plants that helped create the benign climate we currently enjoy. The converse is also true. The more vegetation we lose, the more, la more that's likely to exacerbate climate change and lead to further desertification. And this animation, uh, this shows photosynthetic activity over the course of a number of years. And what you can see is that the boundaries of those deserts, they, they shift quite a lot. And, and that raises the question of whether we could intervene at those boundary conditions um, to, to halt or maybe even reverse desertification. And if you look at some of the organisms that have evolved to live in deserts, there are some amazing examples of adaptations to water scarcity. This is the Namibian fog basking beetle, and it's evolved a way of harvesting its own fresh water in a desert. The way it does this is it comes out at night, crawls to the top of a sand dune, and because it's got a matte black shell, it's able to radiate heat out to the night sky and become slightly cooler than its surroundings. So when the moist breeze blows in off the sea, you get these droplets of water forming on the beetle's shell. Just before sunrise, tips its shell up, water runs down to its mouth, has a good drink, goes off and hides the rest of the day. And um, the ingenuity, if you could call it that, goes even further. Because if you look closely at the beetle's shell, there are lots of little bumps on that shell. And those bumps are hydrophilic. They attract water. And between them, there's a waxy finish which repels water. And the effect of this is that as the droplets start to form on the bumps, they stay in tight spherical beads, which means they're much more mobile than they would be if it was just a film of water over the whole beetle's shell. So even when there's only a small amount of moisture in the air, it's still able to harvest that very effectively and channel it down to its mouth. So an amazing example of an adaptation to a very resource-constrained environment. And in that sense, very relevant to the kind of challenges we're going to be facing over the next few years, next few decades. We're working with the guy that invented the seawater greenhouse. This is a greenhouse designed for arid coastal regions. And the way it works is that you have this whole wall of evaporator grills, and you trickle seawater over that. So that wind blows through, it picks up a lot of moisture, and is cooled in the process. So inside, it's cool and humid, which means the plants need less water to grow. And then at the back of the greenhouse, it condenses a lot of that humidity as fresh water in a process that's effectively identical to the beetle. And what they found with the first seawater greenhouse that was built was it was producing more, slightly more fresh water than it needed for the plants inside. So they just started spreading this on the land around. And the combination of that and the elevated humidity had quite a dramatic effect on the local area. This photograph was taken on completion day, and just one year later, it looked like that. So it was like a green ink blot spreading out from the building, turning barren land back into biologically productive land. And in that sense, going beyond sustainable design to achieve restorative design. So we were keen to scale this up and apply biomimicry ideas to maximize the benefits. And when you think about nature, often you think about it as being all about competition. But actually, in mature ecosystems, you're just as likely to find examples of symbiotic relationships. So an important biomimicry principle is to find ways of bringing technologies together in symbiotic clusters. And the technology that we settled on as an ideal sort of partner for the seawater greenhouse is concentrated solar power, which uses solar tracking mirrors to focus the sun's heat to create electricity. And just to give you some sense of the potential of CSP, consider that we receive 10,000 times as much energy from the sun every year as we use in energy from all forms. 10,000 times. So our energy problems are, are not intractable. It's a challenge to our ingenuity. And the kind of synergies I'm talking about are firstly both these uh, technologies work very well in hot, sunny deserts. CSP needs a supply of demineralized fresh water. That's exactly what the seawater greenhouse produces. CSP produces a lot of waste heat. We'd be able to make use of all that to evaporate more seawater and enhance the restorative benefits. And finally, in the shade under the mirrors, it's possible to grow all sorts of crops that would not grow in direct sunlight. So this is how this scheme would look. The idea is we create this sort of long hedge of greenhouses facing the wind. We'd have concentrated solar power plants at intervals along the way. Some of you might be wondering what we would do with all the salts 
And with biomimicry, if you've got an underutilized resource, you don't think, how am I going to dispose of this? You think, what can I add to the system to create more value? And it turns out that different things crystallize out at different stages. When you evaporate seawater, the first thing to crystallize out is uh, calcium carbonate. And that builds up on the evaporators. And that's what that image on the left is, gradually getting encrusted with the calcium carbonate. So after a while, we could take that out, use it as a lightweight building block. And if you think about the carbon in that, that would have come out of the atmosphere, into the sea, and then locked away in a building product. The next thing is sodium chloride. You can also compress that into a building block, as they did here. This is a hotel in Bolivia. And then after that, there are all sorts of compounds and elements that we could extract, like phosphates, that we need to get back into the desert soils to fertilize them. And there's just about every element of the periodic table so in, in seawater. So it should be possible to extract valuable elements like lithium for high-performance batteries. And um, in, um, in parts of the, the Arabian Gulf, the seawater, uh, the salinity is increasing steadily uh, due to uh, the discharge of waste brine from desalination plants. And it's pushing the ecosystem close to collapse. Now, we would be able to make use of all that waste brine. Uh, we, would we could evaporate it to enhance the restorative benefits and capture the salts, transforming an urgent waste problem into a big opportunity. Really, the Sahara Forest Project is a model for how we could create zero carbon food, abundant renewable energy in some of the most water-stressed parts of the planet, as well as reversing desertification in certain areas. So returning to those big challenges that I mentioned at the beginning, radical increases in resource efficiency, close, closing loops, and a solar economy. They're not just possible, they're, they're critical. And I firmly believe that studying the way nature solves problems will provide a lot of the solutions. But perhaps more than anything, what this thinking provides is a really positive way of talking about sustainable design. Far too much of the talk about the environment uses very negative language. But here, it's about synergies and abundance and optimizing. And this is an important point. Antoine de Saint-Exupéry once said, if you want to build a flotilla of ships, you don't sit around talking about carpentry. No, you need to set people's souls ablaze with visions of exploring distant shores. And that's what we need to do. So let's be positive and let's make progress with what could be the most exciting period of innovation we've ever seen. Thank you. I'm a garbage man. And you might find it interesting that I became a garbage man because I absolutely hate waste. I hope within the next 10 minutes to change the way you think about a lot of the stuff in your life. And I'd like to start at the very beginning. Think back when you were just a kid. How did you look at the stuff in your life? Perhaps it was like these toddler rules. It's my stuff if I saw it first. The entire pile is my stuff if I'm building something. The more stuff that's mine, the better. And of course, it's your stuff if it's broken. <laughs> well, after spending about 20 years in the recycling industry, it's become pretty clear to me that we don't necessarily leave these toddler rules behind as we develop into adults. And let me tell you why I have that perspective. Because each and every day at our recycling plants around the world, we handle about one million pounds of people's discarded stuff. Now, a million pounds a day sounds like a lot of stuff, but it's a tiny drop of the durable goods that are disposed each and every year around the world, well less than 1%. In fact, the United Nations estimates that there's about 85 billion pounds a year of electronics waste that gets discarded around the world each and every year, and that's one of the most rapidly growing parts of our waste stream. And if you throw in other durable goods, like automobiles and so forth, that number well more than doubles. And of course, the more developed the country, the bigger these mountains. Now, when you see these mountains, most people think of garbage. We see above ground mines. And the reason we see mines is because there's a lot of valuable raw materials that went into making all of this stuff in the first place. And it's becoming increasingly important that we figure out how to extract these raw materials from these extremely complicated waste streams. Because as we've heard all week at TED, 
The world's getting to be a smaller place with more people in it who want more and more stuff. And of course, they want the toys and the tools that many of us take for granted. And what goes into making those toys and tools that we use every single day? It's mostly many types of plastics and many types of metals. And the metals we typically get from ore that we mine in ever-widening mines and ever-deep mines around the world. And the plastics we get from oil, which we go to more remote locations and drill ever-deeper wells to extract. And these practices have significant economic and environmental implications that we're already starting to see today. The good news is we are starting to recover materials from our end-of-life stuff and starting to recycle our end-of-life stuff, particularly in regions of the world like here in Europe that have recycling policies in place that require that this stuff be recycled in a responsible manner. Most of what's extracted from our end-of-life stuff, if it makes it to a recycler, are the metals. To put that in perspective, and I'm using steel as a proxy here for metals because it's the most common metal, if your stuff makes it to a recycler, probably over 90% of the metals are going to be recovered and reused for another purpose. The plastics are a whole other story. Well less than 10% are, are recovered. In fact, it's more like 5%. Most of it's incinerated or landfilled. Now, most people think that's because plastics are a throwaway material, have very little value. But actually, plastics are several times more valuable than steel. And there's more plastics produced and consumed around the world on a volume basis every year than steel. So why is such a plentiful and valuable material not recovered at anywhere near the rate of a less valuable material? Well, it's predominantly because metals are very easy to recycle from other materials and from one another. They have very different densities, they have different electrical and magnetic properties, and they even have different colors. So it's very easy for either humans or machines to separate these metals from one another and from other materials. Plastics have overlapping densities over a very narrow range, they have either identical or very similar electrical and magnetic properties, and any plastic can be any color, as you probably well know. So the traditional ways of separating materials just simply don't work for plastics. Another consequence of metals being so easy to recycle by humans is that a lot of our stuff from the developed world, and sadly to say, particularly from the United States, where we don't have any recycling policies in place, like here in Europe, finds its way to developing countries for low-cost recycling. People for as little as a dollar a day pick through our stuff, they extract what they can, which is mostly the metals, circuit boards and so forth, and they leave behind mostly what they can't recover, which is, again, mostly the plastics. Or they burn the plastics to get to the metals in burn houses like you see here, and they extract the metals by hand. Now, why this might be the low economic cost solution this is certainly not the low environmental or human health and safety solution. I call this environmental arbitrage, and it's not fair, it's not safe, and it's not sustainable. Now, because the plastics are so plentiful, and by the way, those other methods don't lead to the recovery of plastics, obviously, but people do try to recover the plastics. This is just one example. This is a photo I took standing on the rooftops of one of the largest slums in the world in Mumbai, India. They store their plastics on the roofs, they bring them below those roofs into small workshops like these, and people try very hard to separate the plastics by color, by shape, by feel, by any technique they can. And sometimes they'll resort to what's known as the burn and sniff technique, where they'll burn the plastic and smell the fumes to try to determine the type of plastic. None of these techniques result in any amount of recycling in any significant way. And by the way, please don't try this technique at home. So what are we to do about this space-age material, at least what we used to call a space-age material, is plastics? Well, I certainly believe that it's far too valuable and far too abundant to keep putting back in the ground or certainly send up in smoke. So about 20 years ago, I literally started in my garage tinkering around trying to figure out how to separate these very similar materials from each other and eventually enlisted a lot of my friends in the uh, mining world, actually, in the, in the uh, plastics world, and we started going around to mining laboratories around the world because, after all, we're doing above-ground mining. And we eventually broke the code. This is the last frontier of recycling. It's the last major material to be recovered at any significant amount on the Earth, and we finally figured out how to do it. And in the process, we started recreating how the plastics industry makes plastics. The traditional way to make plastics is with oil or petrochemicals. You break down the molecules, you recombine them in very specific ways to make all the wonderful plastics that we enjoy each and every day. 
we said there's got to be a more sustainable way to make plastics. And not just sustainable from an environmental standpoint, sustainable from an economic standpoint as well. Well, a good place to start is with waste. It certainly doesn't cost as much as oil, and it's plentiful, as I hope that you've been able to see from the photographs. And because we're not breaking down the plastic into molecules and recombining them, we're using a mining approach to extract the materials. We have significantly lower capital costs in our plant and equipment. We have enormous energy savings. I don't know how many other projects on the planet right now can save 80 to 90 percent of the energy compared to making something the traditional way. And instead of plopping down several hundred million dollars to build a chemical plant that will only make one type of plastic for its entire life, our plants can make any type of plastic we feed them. And we make a drop-in replacement for that plastic that's made from petrochemicals. Our customers get to enjoy huge CO2 savings, they get to close the loop with their products, and they get to make more sustainable products. In the short time period I have, I want to show you a little bit of a sense about how we do this. It starts with metal recyclers, who shred our stuff into very small bits, they recover the metals, and leave behind what's called shredder residue. It's their waste. A very complex mixture of materials, but predominantly plastics. We take out the things that aren't plastics, such as the metals they miss, carpeting, foam, rubber, wood, glass, paper, you name it, even an occasional dead animal, unfortunately. And it goes in the first part of our process here, which is more like traditional recycling. We're sieving the material, we're using magnets, we're using air classification. It looks like a Willy Wonka factory at this point. At the end of this process, we have a mixed plastic composite, many different types of plastics and many different grades of plastics. This goes into the more sophisticated part of our process and the really hard work, multi-step separation process begins. We grind the plastic down to about the size of your small fingernail. We use a very highly automated process to sort those plastics, not only by type, but by grade. And out the end of that part of the process come little flakes of plastic, one type, one grade. We then use optical sorting to color sort this material. We blend it in 50,000 pound blending silos. We push that material to extruders where we melt it, push it through small die holes, make spaghetti-like plastic strands, and we chop those strands into what are called pellets. And this becomes the currency of the plastics industry. This is the same material that you would get from oil. And today, we're producing it from your old stuff. And it's going right back in to your new stuff. So now instead of your stuff ending up on a hillside in a developing country, or literally going up in smoke, you can find your old stuff back on top of your desk in new products, in your office, or back at work in your home. And these are just a few examples of companies that are buying our plastic, replacing virgin plastic to make their new products. So I hope I've changed the way you look at least some of the stuff in your life. We took our clues from Mother Nature. Mother Nature wastes very little, reuses practically everything. And I hope that you stop looking at yourself as a consumer. That's a label I've always hated my entire life. And think of yourself as just using resources in one form until they can be transformed to another form for another use later in time. And finally, I hope you agree with me to change that last toddler rule just a little bit to, if it's broken, it's my stuff. <laughs> Thank you for your time. So I'd like to spend a few minutes with you folks today imagining what our planet might look like in a thousand years. But before I do that, I need to talk to you about synthetic materials, like plastics, which require huge amounts of energy to create, and because of their disposal issues, are slowly poisoning our planet. I also want to tell you and share with you how my team and I have been using mushrooms over the last three years. 
<laughs> not like that. <laughs> We're using mushrooms to create an entirely new class of materials, which perform a lot like plastics during their use, but are made from crop waste and are totally compostable at the end of their lives. <laughs> but first, I need to talk to you about what I consider one of the most egregious offenders in the disposable plastics category. This is a material you all know as styrofoam, but I like to think of it as toxic white stuff. In a single cubic foot of this material, about what would come around your computer or a large television, you have the same energy content of about a liter and a half of petrol. Yet after just a few weeks of use, you'll throw this material in the trash. And this isn't just found in packaging. $20 billion of this material is produced every year in everything from building materials to surfboards to coffee cups to tabletops. And that's not the only place it's found. The EPA estimates in the United States, by volume, this material occupies 25% of our landfills. Even worse is when it finds its way into our natural environment, on the side of the road or next to a river. If it's not picked up by a human, like me and you, it'll stay there for thousands and thousands of years. Perhaps even worse is when it finds its way into our oceans, like in the great plastic gyre, where these materials are being mechanically broken into smaller and smaller bits, but they're not really going away. They're not biologically compatible. They're basically fouling up Earth's respiratory and circulatory systems. And because these materials are so prolific, because they're found in so many places, there's one other place you'll find this material, styrene, which is made from benzene, a known carcinogen. You'll find it inside of you. So for all these reasons, I think we need better materials. And there are three key principles we can use to guide these materials. The first is feedstocks. Today we use a single feedstock, petroleum, to heat our homes, power our cars, and make most of the materials you see around you. We recognize this as a finite resource, and it's simply crazy to do this, to put a liter and a half of petrol in the trash every time you get a package. Second of all, we should really strive to use far less energy in creating these materials. I say far less because 10% isn't gonna cut it. We should be talking about half, quarter, one-tenth the energy content. And lastly, and I think perhaps most importantly, we should be creating materials that fit into what I call nature's recycling system. This recycling system has been in place for the last billion years. I fit into it, you fit into it, and 100 years tops, my body can return to the earth with no pre-processing. Yet that packaging I got in the mail yesterday is gonna last for thousands of years, right? This is crazy. But nature provides us with a really good model here. When a tree's done using its leaves, its solar collectors, these amazing molecular photon capturing devices at the end of a season, it doesn't pack them up, take them to the leaf reprocessing center and have them melted down to form new leaves. It just drops them the shortest distance possible to the forest floor, where they're actually upcycled into next year's topsoil. And this gets us back to the mushrooms. Because in nature, mushrooms are the recycling system. And what we've discovered is that by using a part of the mushroom you've probably never seen, analogous to its root structure, it's called mycelium, we can actually grow materials with many of the same properties of conventional synthetics. Now, mycelium is an amazing material because it's a self-assembling material that actually takes things we would consider waste, things like seed husks or woody biomass, and can transform them into a chitinous polymer, which you can form into almost any shape. In our process, we basically use it as a glue. And by using mycelium as a glue, you can mold things just like you do in the plastic industry. And you can create materials with many different properties. Materials that are insulating, fire resistant, moisture resistant, vapor resistant, materials that can absorb impacts, that can absorb acoustical impacts. But these materials are grown from agricultural byproducts, not made out of petroleum. And because they're made of natural materials, they're 100% compostable in your own backyard. So I'd like to share with you the four basic steps required to make these materials. The first is selecting a feedstock, preferably something that's regional, that's in your area, right? Local manufacturing. The next is actually taking this feedstock and putting in a tool, physically filling an enclosure, a mold, in whatever shape you want to get. Then, you actually grow the mycelium through these particles, and that's where the magic happens, because the organism is doing the work in this process, not the equipment. The final step is, of course, the product, whether it's a packaging material, a tabletop, or a building block. Our vision is local manufacturing, like the local food movement for production. So we've created formulations for all around the world using regional byproducts. If you're in China, you might use a rice husk or cottonseed hull. If you're in Northern Europe or North America, you can use things like buckwheat husks or oat hulls. We then process these husks 
with some basic equipment, and I want to share with you a quick video from our facility that gives you a sense of how this looks at scale. So what you're seeing here is actually cotton hulls from Texas in this case. It's a waste product. And what they're doing in our equipment is going through a continuous system which cleans, cooks, cools, and pasteurizes these materials while also continuously inoculating them with our mycelium. This gives us a continuous stream of material that we can put into almost any shape, though today we're making corner blocks. And it's when this lid goes on the part that the magic really starts. Because the manufacturing process is our organism. It'll actually begin to digest these ag wastes and over the next five days, assemble them into biocomposites. Our entire facility is comprised of thousands and thousands and thousands of these tools, sitting indoors in the dark, quietly self-assembling materials and everything from building materials to, in this case, a packaging corner block. So I've said a number of times that we grow materials, and it's kind of hard to picture how that happens. So my team has taken five days' worth of growth, a typical growth cycle for us, and condensed it into a 15-second time lapse. And I want you to really watch closely these little white dots on the screen. Because over the five-day period, what they do is extend out and through this material, using the energy that's contained in these seed husks to build this chitinous polymer matrix. This matrix self-assembles, growing through and around the particles, making millions and millions of tiny fibers. And what parts of the seed husk we don't digest actually become part of the final physical composite. So in front of your eyes, this part just self-assembled. It, it actually takes a, lot, a little longer. It takes five days. Uh, but it's much faster than conventional farming. The last step, of course, is application. In this case, we've grown a corner block. A major Fortune 500 furniture amp maker uses these corner blocks to protect their tables and shipment. They used to use a plastic packaging buffer, but we were able to give them the exact same physical performance with our grown material. Best of all, when it gets to the customer, it's not trash, right? They can actually put this in their natural ecosystem without any processing, and it's going to improve the local soil. So why mycelium? Well, the first reason is local open feedstocks. You want to be able to do this anywhere in the world and not worry about peak rice hull or peak cottonseed hulls, because you have multiple choices. The next is self-assembly, because the organism is actually doing most of the work in this process. You don't need a lot of equipment to set up a production facility, so you can have lots of small facilities spread all across the world. Biological yield is really important, and because 100% of what we put in the tool becomes the final product, even the parts that aren't digested become part of the structure, we're getting incredible yield rates. Natural polymers, well, I think that's what's most important. Because these polymers have been tried and tested in our ecosystem for the last billion years, in everything from mushrooms to crustaceans. They're not going to clog up Earth's ecosystems. They work great. And while today we can practically guarantee that yesterday's packaging is going to be here in 10,000 years, what I want to guarantee is that in 10,000 years, our descendants, our children's children, will be living happily and in harmony with a healthy earth. And I think that can be some really good news. Thank you. Why grow homes? Because we can. Right now, America is in an unremitting state of trauma, and there's a cause for that. Right? We've got McPeople, McCars, McHouses. Right? As an architect, I have to confront something like this. So what's a technology that will allow us to make ginormous houses? Well, it's been around for 2,500 years. It's called pleaching, or grafting trees together, or grafting inosculate matter into one contiguous vascular system. And we do something different than what we did in the past. We add a, a kind of a modicum of intelligence to that. We use CNC to make scaffolding to train semi-epithetic matter plants into a specific geometry that makes a home that we call a fab tree hat. It fits into the environment. It is the environment. It is the landscape, right? And you can have 100 million of these homes, and it's great because they suck carbon, right? They're perfect. You can have 100 million families or 
take things out of the suburbs because these are homes that are a, a part of the environment. Imagine pre-growing a village, right? It takes about seven to 10 years and everything is green, right? So not only do we do, do, we do the veggie house, we also do uh, uh, the in vitro meat habitat or homes that we're doing research on now uh, in Brooklyn, where as an architecture office, we're the first of its kind to put in a molecular cell biology lab and start experimenting with regenerative medicine and tissue engineering and start thinking about what the future would be if architecture and biology became one. So we've been doing this for a couple of years and that's our lab. And what we do is we grow extracellular matrix from pigs, we use a modified inkjet printer and we print geometry. We put geometry where we can make industrial design objects, right? Like uh, you know, shoes, leather belts, handbags, etc., uh, where no sentient creature is harmed. It's victimless. It's meat from a test tube. So our theory is that eventually we should be, we should be doing this with homes. So here is a typical stud wall in uh, architectural construction, and this is a section of our proposal for a meat house, where you can see we use fatty cells as insulation, cilia for dealing with wind loads, and sphincter muscles for the. Promotions, we should not move quickly to the desert. So, first a small housekeeping announcement. Please switch off your proper English check programs installed in your brain. <laughs> so, welcome to the golden desert, Indian desert. It receives the least rainfall in the country, lowest rainfall, if you are well versed with inches, nine inches, centimeters, 16 inches. The groundwater is 300 feet deep, 100 meters, and in most parts it is saline, not fit for drinking. So you can't install hand pumps or tube wells, though there is no electricity in most of the villages, but Suppose you use the green technology, solar pumps, they are of no use in this area. So welcome to the Golden Desert. Clouds seldom visit this area, but we find 40 different names of clouds in this dialect used here. There are a number of techniques to harvest rain. This is a new word, it's a new program. But for the Desert Society, this is no program, this is their life. And they harvest rain in many ways. So this is the first device they use in harvesting rain. It's called kun, somewhere it is called tanka. And you can notice they have created a kind of false sketchment. The desert is there, sand dunes, some small field, and this is all big. Uh, raised a platform. You can notice the small holes. The water will fall on this catchment and there is a slope. Sometimes our engineers and architects do not care about slopes in bathrooms, but here they will care properly. <laughs> and the water will go where it should go. And then it is 40 feet deep. Uh, the uh, waterproofing is done perfectly, better than our city uh, contractors, because not a single drop should go waste in this. They collect one uh, hundred thousand liters in one season, and this is pure drinking water. Below the surface, there is hard saline water, but now you can have this for year around. It's uh, two houses. We often use a term called bylaws because we are used to get written things. But here it is unwritten bylaw and people make their house and the water storage uh, tanks. These raised platform just like this uh, uh, stage. In fact, they go 15 feet deep and collect rainwater from roof this is small pipe, and from their courtyard, it can also harvest something like 25,000 in a uh, good monsoon. Another big one, this uh, is, of course, uh, out of the uh, hardcore desert area. This is near Jaipur. This is called Jagar Port, and it can 
collect 6 million gallons of rain water in one season. The age is 400 years. So since 400 years, it has been giving you uh, almost uh, 6 uh, million gallons of water per season. You can calculate the price of that water. It draws water from 15 kilometers of canals. You can see a modern road, hardly 50 years old. It can break sometimes, but this 400-year-old canal, which draws water, it is maintained for so many generations. Of course, if you want to go inside, the two doors are locked, but they can be open for dead people. And uh, <laughs> we request them. You can see a person coming up with two canisters of water. And the water level, these are not empty canisters. Water level is right up to this. It can envy many municipalities. The, the, the color, the taste, the purity of this water. And this is what they call zero B type of water because it comes from the clouds, pure distilled water. We stop for a quick commercial break and then we come back to the traditional systems. The government thought that this is a very backward area and we should bring a multi-million dollar project to bring water from the Himalayas. That's why I said that this is a commercial break. <laughs> but we will come back once again to the traditional thing. So water from 300, 400 kilometers away, soon it became like this. In many portions, water hyacinth covered these big canals like anything. Of course, there are some areas where water is reaching. I'm not saying that it is not reaching at all. But the tail end, the Jaisalmer uh, area, you will notice in Bikane, things like this. Where the water hyacinth couldn't grow, the sand is flowing in these canals. <laughs> the bonus is that you can find wildlife around it. <laughs> we had full page advertisements some 30 years, uh, 25 years ago when this canal came. They said that throw away your traditional systems. These new cement tanks will supply you piped water. It's a dream and it became a dream also because uh, soon uh, the water was not able to reach these areas and people started renovating their own structures. These are all traditional water structures, which we won't be able to explain in such a short time. But you can see that no woman is standing on those and <laughs> they are working here. So we move. Jaisalmer. This is heart of desert. This uh, town was established 800 years ago. I'm not sure by that time Bombay was there, or Delhi was there, or Chennai was there, or Bangalore was there. So this was the terminal point for Silk Route, well connected 800 years ago through Europe. None of us were able to go to Europe, but Jaisalmer was well connected to it. Uh, and this is the th uh, 16 centimeter area. Uh, such a limited rainfall and highest uh, colorful life flourished in these areas. You won't find water in this slide, but it is invisible. Somewhere a stream or a riverlet is running through it. Or if you want to paint, you can paint it blue throughout. Because every roof which you see in this picture collects rainwater drops and deposit in the rooms. But apart from this system, they designed 52 beautiful water bodies around this town. And uh, what we call private-public partnership, you can add state also. So state, public, and uh, private entrepreneurs work together to build this beautiful uh, water body. And, uh, it's a kind of uh, water body for all seasons. You will admire it. Just behold the beauty throughout the year. Whether water level goes up or down, the beauty is there throughout. 
another water body uh, dried up of course uh, during the summer period but you can see how the traditional society combines engineering with aesthetics with the art these statues marvelous statues gives you an idea of water table when this uh, rain comes and the water starts filling this tank it will submerge these beautiful statues and what we call in english today mass communication this was for mass communication everybody in the town will know that this elephant has drawn so water will be there for 7 months or 9 months or 12 months and then they will come and worship uh, this pond pay respect their gratitude another small water body called jaseri it is difficult to translate in english especially in my english perhaps the nearest will be glory reputation the reputation in desert of this small water body is that it never dries up in severe drought periods nobody has seen this water body uh, getting dried up and perhaps they uh, they knew the uh, future also it was designed some 150 years ago but perhaps they knew that on 6th november 2009 there will be a ted green and blue session so they painted it like this <laughs> dry water body children are standing on a very difficult device to explain this is called kui we have in english uh, surface water and ground water but this is not ground water you can draw ground water from any well but this is no ordinary well it squeezes the moisture hidden in the hidden in the sand and they have termed this water as the third one called rejani and um, there is a gypsum belt running below it and it was deposited by the great mother earth some 3 million years ago and where we have this uh, gypsum strip they can harvest this water this is the same dried water body now you don't find any kui they are all submerged but they when the water goes down they will be able to draw water from those structures throughout the year this year they have received only 6 cm 6 centimeter of rainfall and they can telephone you that if you find any water problem in your ka, in your city delhi bombay bangalore mysore please come to our area of 6 cm we can give you water <laughs> how they maintain them there are our three things concept planning making the actual thing and also maintaining them these structures were maintained for centuries by generations without any department without any funding so the secret is shraddha respect uh, your own thing uh, not personal property my property every time so these stone pillars will remind you that you are entering into a water body area don't spit don't do anything wrong so that the clean water can be collected another pillar stone pillar on your right side if you climb these three six steps you will find something very nice this was done in 11th century and you have to go further down they say that a picture is worth a thousand words so we can save a thousand words right now and another thousand words if the water table goes down you will find new stairs if it comes up some of them will be submerged so throughout the year this beautiful system will give you some pleasure three sides such steps on fourth side there is a four story building where you can organize such ted conferences any time <laughs> excuse me who built these structures they are in front of you the best civil engineers we had the best planners the best architects we can say that because of them because of their forefathers india could get the first engineering college in 1847 there were no english medium schools at that time even no hindi schools no schools but such people
compelled the East India Company, which came here for business, a very dirty kind of business, but, uh, but not to create uh, engineering colleges, but because of them, first engineering college was created in a small village, not in the town. The last point, we all know in our primary schools that camel is a ship of desert. So you can find through your jeep a camel and a cart. This tire comes from the aeroplane. So look at the beauty from the desert society who can harvest rainwater and also create something, a thrown uh, tire from a jet uh, plane and used in a camel cart. Last picture, it's a tattoo, 2,000 years old tattoo. They were using it on their body. Tattoo was at one time a kind of a, uh, blacklisted or uh, gone thing, but now it is in thing. So this is, uh, you, can, you can copy this tattoo. I have some posters of this. Uh, uh, the center of life is water. These are the beautiful waves. These are the beautiful stairs which we just uh, saw in one of the slides. These are the trees. And these are the flowers which give, which add fragrance to our life. So this is the message of desert. Thank you very much. So, first of all, I wish I had your eloquence, truly, in any language. <laughs> yeah. These artifacts and designs are, um, are inspiring. Do you believe that they can be used elsewhere, that the world can learn from this, or is this just right for this place? No, the, the basic idea is to utilize whatever falls on our area. So the ponds, the open bodies are everywhere, uh, right from Sri Lanka to uh, Kashmir and in other parts also. And then these takas, which is store water, and there are two types of things, one recharge and one is stores. So it depends on the terrain, but queen, which uses the gypsum belt, for that you have to uh, go back to your calendar three million uh, years ago, if it is there, it can be done right now, otherwise it can't be done. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. The will to live life differently can start in some of the most unusual places. This is where I come from, Todmorden. It's a market town in the north of England. 15,000 people between Leeds and Manchester. Fairly normal market town. Used to look like this, and now it's more like this. With fruit and veg and herbs sprouting up all over the place. We call it propaganda gardening. Corner of our railway station car park, front of our health centre, people's front gardens, and even in front of the police station. <laughs> we've got edible canal topaz, and we've got sprouting cemeteries. The soil is extremely good. <laughs> we've even invented a new form of tourism. It's called vegetable tourism. And believe it or not, people come from all over the world to poke around in our raised beds, even when there's not much growing. 
but it starts a conversation. And you know, we're not doing it because we're bored. <laughs> we're doing it because we want to start a revolution. We try to answer this simple question, can you find a unifying language that cuts across age and income and culture that will help people themselves find a new way of living? See spaces around them differently, think about the resource they use differently, interact differently. Can we find that language? And then can we replicate those actions? And the answer would appear to be yes, and the language would appear to be food. So three and a half years ago, a few of us sat around the kitchen table and we just invented the whole thing. <laughs> we came up with a really simple game plan that we put to a public meeting. We did not consult, we did not write a report, enough of all that. <laughs> and we said to that public meeting in Todmorden, look, let's imagine that our town is focused around three plates. A community plate, the way we live our everyday lives, a learning plate. What we, learn, what we teach our kids in school and what, we, what new skills we share amongst ourselves and business, what, what we do with the pound in our pocket and which businesses we choose to support. Now, let's imagine those plates agitated with community actions around food. If we start one of those community plates spinning, that's really great, that really starts to empower people, but if we can then spin that community plate with the learning plate and then spin it with the business plate, we've got a real show there, we've got some action theatre. We're starting to build resilience ourselves. We're starting to reinvent community ourselves. And we've done it all without a flipping strategy document. <laughs> and here's the thing as well. We've not asked anybody's permission to do this, we're just doing it. <laughs> and we are certainly not waiting for that check to drop through the letterbox before we start. And most importantly of all, we are not daunted by the sophisticated arguments that say these small actions are meaningless in the face of tomorrow's problems because I have seen the power of small actions and it is awesome. So, back to the public meeting. <laughs> we put that proposition to the meeting, two seconds, and then the room exploded. I have never, ever experienced anything like that in my life. And it's been the same in every single room, in every town that we've ever told our story. People are ready and respond to the story of food. They want positive actions they can engage in. And in their bones, they know it's time to take personal responsibility and invest in more kindness to each other and to the environment. And since we had that meeting three and a half years ago, it's been a heck of a roller coaster. We started with a seed swap. Really simple stuff. And then we took an area of land, a strip on the side of our main road, which was a dog toilet, basically, and we turned it into a really lovely herb garden. We took the corner of the car park in the station that you saw, and we made vegetable beds for everybody to share and pick from themselves. We went to the doctors. We've just had a £6 million health centre built in Todmorden, and for some reason that I cannot comprehend, it has been surrounded by prickly plants. <laughs> so... We went to the doctor, said, would you mind us taking them up? They said, absolutely fine, provided you get planning permission and you do it in Latin and you do it in triplicate. So we did. <laughs> and now there are fruit trees and bushes and herbs and vegetables around that doctor's surgery. And there's been lots of other examples like the corn that was in front of the police station and the old people's home that we've planted up with food that they can pick and grow. But it isn't just about growing because we all are part of this jigsaw. It's about taking those artistic people in your community and doing some fabulous designs in those raised beds to explain to people what's growing there. Because there's so many people that don't really recognise a vegetable unless it's in a bit of plastic with a bit of an instruction packet on the top. <laughs> so, we have some people who design these things. If it looks like this, please don't pick it. But if it looks like this, help yourself. This is about sharing and investing in kindness. And for those people that don't want to do either of those things, maybe they can cook. So we pick them seasonally and then we go on the street or in the pub or in the church or wherever people are living their lives. This is about us going to the people and saying, we are all part of the local food jigsaw, we are all part of a solution. And then because we know we've got vegetable tourists and we love them to bits and they're absolutely fantastic, we thought, what can we do to give them an even better experience? So we invented, without asking of course, the incredible edible green route. And this is a route of exhibition gardens and edible towpaths and 
bee-friendly sites and the story of pollinators. And it's a route that we designed that takes people through the whole of our town, past our cafes and our small shops, through our market, not just to and fro from the supermarket. And we're hoping that in changing people's footfall around our town, we're also changing their behaviour. And then there's the second plate, the learning plate. Well, we're in partnership with the high school. We've created a company. We are designing and building an aquaponics unit in some land that we spare at the back of the high school, like you do. And now we're going to be growing fish and vegetables in an orchard with bees. And the kids are helping us build that. And the kids are on the board. And because the community was really keen on working with the high school, the high school is now teaching agriculture. And because it's teaching agriculture, we started to think, how can we then get those kids that, are, that, that never had a qualification before in their lives but are really excited about growing, how can we give them some more experience? So we got some land that was donated by a local garden centre. It was really quite muddy, but in a truly incredible way, totally voluntary-led, we have put, turned that into a market garden training centre. And that is polytunnels and raised beds and all the things you need to get the soil under your fingers and think maybe there's a job in this for me in the future. And because we were doing that, some local academics said, you know, we could help design a commercial horticulture course for you. There's not one that we know of. So they're doing that and we're going to launch it later this year. And it's all an experiment and it's all voluntary. And then there's the third plate. Because if you walk through an edible landscape and if you learn new skills and if you start to get interested in what's growing seasonally, you might just want to spend more of your own money in support of local producers. Not just veg, but meat and cheese and beer and whatever else it might be. But then we're just a community group, you know, we're just all volunteers, what could we actually do? So we did some really simple things. We fundraised, we got some blackboards, we put Incredible Edible on the top, we gave it to every market trader that was selling locally, and they scribbled on what they were selling in any one week. Really popular, people congregated around it, sales were up. And then we had a chat with the farmers, and we said we're really serious about this, but they didn't actually believe us. So we thought, OK, um, what should we do? I know, if we can create a campaign around, around one product and show them there is local loyalty to that product, maybe they'll change their mind and see we're serious. So we launched a campaign, because it just amuses me, called Every Egg Matters. And <laughs> what we did <laughs> was we put people on our egg map. It's a stylized map of Todmorden. Uh, anybody that's selling their excess eggs at the garden gate, perfectly legally, to their neighbours, we've stuck on there. We started with four. And we've now got 64 on. And the result of that was that people were then going into shops asking for a local tobin and egg. And the result of that was some farmers upped the amount of flocks they got free rent birds and then they went on to meat birds. And although these are really, really small steps, that, that increasing local economic confidence is starting to play out in a number of ways. And we now have farmers doing cheese and they've upped their flocks of rare breed pigs. They're doing pasties and pies and things that they would have never have done before. We've got increasing market stalls selling local food, and in a survey that local students did for us, 49% of all food traders in that town said that their bottom line had increased because of what we were actually doing. And we're just volunteers, and it's only an experiment. <laughs> now, none of this is rocket science. It certainly is not clever, and it's not original. But it is joined up, and it is inclusive. This is not a movement for those people who are going to sort themselves out anyway. This is a movement for everyone. We have a motto, if you eat, you're in. <laughs> across age, across income, across culture. It's been really quite a rollercoaster experience. But going back to that first question that we asked, is it replicable? Yeah. It most certainly is replicable. More than 30 towns in England now are spinning the incredible edible plates. Whichever way they want to do it, they're of their own volition, they're trying to make their own lives differently. And worldwide, we've got communities across America and Japan. It's incredible, isn't it? I mean, what can you say? America and Japan and New Zealand. People, after the earthquake in New Zealand, visited us in order to incorporate some of this public spiritedness around local growing into the heart of Christchurch. And none of this takes more money. And none of this demands a bureaucracy. But it does demand that you think things differently and you are prepared to bend budgets and work programmes in order to create that supportive framework that compute communities can bounce off. And there's some great ideas already in our patch. Our local authority has decided to make everywhere 
uh, Incredible Edible. And in support of that, have decided to do two things. First, they're going to create an asset register of spare land that they've got, put it in a food bank so that communities can use that wherever they live. And they're going to underpin that with a licence. And then they said to every single one of their workforce, if you can, help those communities grow and help them maintain their spaces. Suddenly, we're seeing actions on the ground from local government. We're seeing this mainstreamed. We are responding creatively at last to what Rio demanded of us. And there's lots more you could do. I mean, just to list a few. One, please stop putting prickly plants around public buildings. It's a waste of space. <laughs> Secondly, please create please, please create edible landscapes so that our children start to walk past their food day in, day out, on our high streets, in our parks, wherever that might be. Inspire local planners to put the food sites at the heart of the town and the city plan, not relegate them to the edges of the settlements that nobody can see. Encourage all our schools to take this seriously. This isn't a second-class exercise. If we want to inspire the farmers of tomorrow, then please let us say to every school... Create a sense of purpose around the importance of the environment, local food and soils. Put that at the heart of your school culture and you will create a different generation. There are so many things you can do, but ultimately, this is about something really simple. Through an organic process, through an increasing recognition of the power of small actions, we are starting at last to believe in ourselves again and to believe in our capacity, each and every one of us, to build a different and a kinder future. And in my book, that's incredible. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a few pictures, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about how I'm able to do what I do. All these houses uh, are built from between 70 and 80 percent recycled materials, stuff that was headed to the mulcher, the landfill, the burn pile. It was all just gone. This is the first house I built. Uh, this double front door here with the uh, three-light transom, that was headed to the landfill. Uh, have a little turret there. And then uh, these uh, buttons that on the corbels here, uh, right there, those are hickory nuts, and these, uh, these buttons there, those are chicken eggs, and uh, of course first you have breakfast, and then you, uh, you, you fill the shell full of Bondo and paint it and nail it up, and uh, you have an architectural button in just a fraction of the time. Um, then this is a look at, at the inside, uh, you can see the three light transom there with the uh, eyebrow windows, certainly an architectural antique, um, headed to the landfill, even the lock set is probably worth $200. Uh, everything in the kitchen was salvaged. There's a 1952 O'Keefe Merritt stove, if you like to cook, cool stove. Uh, this is going up into the turret. I got that staircase uh, for $20, including delivery to my lot. Uh, <laughs> uh, then, uh, looking up in the turret, you see there are bulges and pokes and sags and so forth. Well, if that ruins your life, well, then you shouldn't live there. Uh, uh, this is... Uh, a laundry chute, and this right here is a shoe last, and those are those cast iron things you see at antique shops. So I had one of those, so I made some low-tech gadgetry there, where you just stomp on the shoe last, and then the door flies open, you throw your laundry down. And then uh, if you're smart enough, it goes into a basket on top of the washer. If not, it goes, goes into the toilet. <laughs> uh, this is a bathtub I made. I made out of scrap uh, two by four here, started with a rim there, and then uh, glued and nailed it up into a flat 
corked it up and flipped it over and then did, did the two profiles on this side. It's a two-person tub. Uh, after all, uh, it's not just a question of hygiene, but there's a possibility of recreation as well. Uh, then this, uh, this faucet here is uh, just a piece of uh, Osage orange. It, uh, it looks a little phallic, but after all, it's a bathroom. Uh, uh, then this is a house based on a Budweiser can. It doesn't look like a can of beer, but uh, the design takeoffs are absolutely unmistakable. The barley hops design worked up into the eaves. Then the dental work comes directly off the can. It's red, white, blue, and silver. Then these uh, corbels going down underneath the eaves are that little design that comes off the can. I just put a can on a copier and kept enlarging it until I got the size I want. Then uh, on the can it says, this is the famous Budweiser beer we know of, no other beer, blah, 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 blah. So we changed that and put, this is the famous Budweiser house. We don't know of any other house, and so forth and so on. Then there's a deadbolt. It's a fence from a 1930 Shaper, which is a very angry woodworking machine. And uh, they gave me the fence, but they didn't give me the Shaper, so we made a deadbolt out of it. Uh, that'll keep bull elephants out, I promise. <laughs> and, and sure enough, we've had no, no problems with bull elephants. <laughs> Uh, the shower is intended to simulate a glass of beer. We've got bubbles going up there and then suds at the top with lumpy tiles. Where do you get lumpy tiles? Well, of course you don't, but I get a lot of toilets, and so you just dispatch a toilet with a hammer, and then you have lumpy tiles. Uh, and then uh, uh, the faucet there is uh, a beer tap. Uh, then uh, this uh, panel of glass is the same panel of glass that occurs in every middle-class front door in America. We're getting tired of it. It's kind of cliched now. So if you put it in the front door, your design fails. So don't put it in the front door. Put it somewhere else. It's a pretty panel of glass. But then if you put it in the front door, people say, oh, you're trying to be like those guys, and you didn't make it. So don't put it there. Um, then uh, another bathroom upstairs. This light up here is the same light that occurs in every middle-class foyer in America. Don't put it in the foyer. Put it in the shower or in the closet, but not in the foyer. Um, then somebody gave me a bidet, so it got a bidet. Uh, this little house here, uh, those branches there are made out of uh, blood arc or Osage orange. And these uh, pictures will keep scrolling as I talk a little bit. In order to do what I do, you have to understand what causes waste in the building industry. Our housing has become a commodity, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but the first cause of waste is probably even buried in our DNA. Human beings have a need for maintaining consistency of the apperceptive mass. <laughs> what does that mean? What it means is for every perception we have, it needs to tally with the one like it before, or we don't have continuity and we become a little bit disoriented. So I can show you an object you've never seen before. Oh. That's a cell phone. But you've never seen this one before. What you're doing is sizing up the pattern of structural features here, and uh, then you go through your data banks, cell phone, oh, that's a cell phone. But if I took a bite out of it, you go, wait a second. <laughs> that's not a cell phone. That's, that's one of those new uh, chocolate cell phones. <laughs> and you'd have to start a new category right between cell phones and chocolate. That's... That's how we process information. So you translate that to the building industry. If we have a wall of window panes and one pane is cracked, we go, oh dear, that's cracked, let's repair it, let's take it out, throw it away so nobody can use it, and put a new one in because that's what you do with a cracked pane. Never mind that it doesn't affect our lives at all. It only rattles that expected pattern and unity of structural features. However, if we took a small hammer and we added cracks to all the other windows, <laughs> then we have a pattern. Because gestalt psychology emphasizes the recognition of pattern over parts that comprise a pattern. We'll go, oh, that's nice. So uh, that serves me every day. Repetition creates pattern. If I have 100 of these, 100 of those, it doesn't make any difference what these and those are. If I can repeat anything, I have the possibility of a pattern. From hickory nuts and chicken eggs, shards of glass, branch, it doesn't make any difference. That causes a lot of waste in the building industry. The second is Friedrich Nietzsche, along about 1885, wrote a book titled The Birth of Tragedy. And in there, he said that cultures tend to swing between one of two perspectives. On the one hand, we have an Apollonian perspective, which is very crisp and premeditated and intellectualized and perfect. On the other end of the spectrum, we have a Dionysian perspective, which is more given to the passions and intuition, tolerant of organic texture and human gesture. 
So the way the Apollonian personality takes a picture or hangs a picture is they'll get out a transit and a laser level and a micrometer. Okay, honey, a thousandth of an inch to the left, that's where we want the picture. Right, perfect. Predicated on plumb level, square, and centered. The Dionysian personality takes the picture and goes, That's the difference. I feature blemish. I feature organic process. Dead center John Dewey. Uh, Apollonian mindset creates mountains of waste. If something isn't perfect, if it doesn't line up with that premeditated model, dumpster, oop, scratch, dumpster, oop, this, oop, that, landfill, landfill, landfill. The third thing is arguably the Industrial Revolution started in the Renaissance with the rise of humanism and got a little jump start along about the French Revolution. By the middle of the 19th century, it's in full flower. And we have dumaflages and gizmos and contraptions that will do anything that we, up to that point, had to do by hand. So now we have standardized materials. Well, trees don't grow two inches by four inches, eight, 10, and 12 feet tall. <laughs> we create mountains of waste, and they're doing a pretty good job there in the forest, working uh, all the byproduct of their industry with OSB and particle board and so forth and so on. But it does no good to be responsible at the point of harvest in the forest if consumers are wasting the harvest at the point of consumption. And that's what's happening. And so if something isn't standard, oops, dumpster, oop, this, oop, warp, no. Nope. If you buy a two by four and it's not straight, you can take it back. Oh, I'm so sorry, sir. We'll get you a straight one. Well, I feature all those warped things because repetition creates pattern and it's from the Dionysian perspective. The fourth thing is labor is disproportionately more expensive than materials. Well, that's just a myth. And here's a story. Jim Tillis, one of the guys I trained, I said, Jim, it's time now. I got a job for you as a foreman on a framing crew. It's time for you to go. Dan, I just don't think I'm ready. Uh, Jim, uh, it's time you, the Dan, oh. So he hired on. And he was out there with his tape measure going through the trash heap looking for header material, which is the board that goes over a door. I think he'd impress his boss. That's how I taught him to do it. And the superintendent walked up and said, what are you doing? Oh, just looking for some header material, waiting for that, that kudo. He said, no, no, I'm not paying you to go through the trash. Get back to work. And he had the wherewithal to say. He said, you know, if you were paying me $300 an hour, I can see how you might say that. But right now, I'm saving you $5 a minute. Do the math. Good call, Tullus. From now on, you guys hit this paw first. And the irony is I wasn't very good at math. But <laughs> once in a while, you get access to the control room, and then you can kind of mess with the dials, and that's what happened there. The fifth thing is that maybe after 2,500 years, Plato is still having his way with us in his notion of perfect forms. He said that we have in our noggin the perfect idea of what we want, and we force environmental resources to accommodate that. So we have, all have in our head the perfect house, the American dream, which is a house, the dream house. The problem is we can't afford it. So we have the American dream look-alike, which is a mobile home. Now there's a blight on the planet. <laughs> it's a chattel mortgage, uh, just like furniture, just like a car. You write the check and instantly it depreciates 30%. After a year, you can't get insurance on everything you have in it, only on 70%. Wired with 14 gauge wire typically, nothing wrong with that, unless you ask it to do what 12 gauge wire is supposed to do, and that's what happens. It outgasses formaldehyde so much so that there is a federal law in place to warn new mobile home buyers the formaldehyde atmosphere danger. Are we being just numbingly stupid? The walls are this thick. The whole thing has the structural value of corn. So I thought Palm Harbor Village was over there. No, no, we had a wind last night. It's gone now. <laughs> then when they degrade, what do you do with them? Now, all that, that Apollonian Platonic model is what the building industry is predicated on, and there are a number of things that exacerbate that. One is that all the professionals, all the tradesmen, vendors, uh, inspectors, engineers, architects, all think like this. And then it works its way back to the consumer who demands the same model. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. We can't get out of it. Then here come the marketeers and the advertisers. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Uh, we buy stuff we didn't know we needed. 
All we have to do is look at what one company did with carbonated prune juice. How disgusting. <laughs> but you know what they did? They hooked a metaphor into it and said, I drink Dr. Pepper. And pretty soon, we're swilling that stuff by the lake full, by the billions of gallons. It doesn't even have real prunes. It doesn't even keep you regular. <laughs> my, oh, my, that makes it worse. And we get sucked into that faster than anything. Then a man named Jean-Paul Sartre wrote a book titled Being in Nothingness. It's a pretty quick read. You can snap through it in maybe, <laughs> maybe two years if you read eight hours a day. In there, he talked about the divided self. He said, human beings act differently when they know they're alone than when they know somebody else is around. So if I'm eating spaghetti and I know I'm alone, I can eat like a backhoe. I can, I can wipe my mouth on my sleeve, a napkin on the table, chew with my mouth open, make little noises, scratch wherever I want. But as soon as you walk in, I go, ooh, there's spaghetti sauce there. Now I'm going to laugh, half bites, chew with my mouth closed, no scratching. Now, what I'm doing is fulfilling your expectations of how I should live my life. I feel that expectation, and so I accommodate it, and I'm living my life according to what you expect me to do. That happens in the building industry as well. That's why all of our subdivisions look the same. Sometimes we even have these formalized uh, cultural expectations. I'll bet all your shoes match. Sure enough, we all buy into that. <laughs> and with, with gated communities, we have a formalized expectation. With a homeowners association, sometimes those guys are Nazis. My, oh my. That exacerbates and continues this model. The last thing is gregariousness. Human beings are a social species. We like to hang together in groups, just like wildebeest, just like lions. Wildebeest don't hang with lions because lions eat wildebeest. Human beings are like that. We do what that group does that we're trying to identify with. And so you see this in junior high a lot. Those kids, they'll work all summer long, kill themselves, so that they can afford one pair of designer jeans so along about September, they can stride in and go, I'm important today. See, whoop, don't touch my designer jeans. I see you don't have designer jeans. You, you don't, you're not one of the beautiful. See, I'm one of the beautiful people. See my jeans? Right there is reason enough to have uniforms. And so that happens in the building industry as well. We have confused Maslow's hierarchy of needs just a little bit. On the bottom tier, we have basic needs, shelter, clothing, food, water, uh, mating, so forth. Second, security. Third, relationships. Fourth, status, self-esteem. That is vanity. And we're taking vanity and shoving it down here. And so we end up with vain decisions and we can't even afford our mortgage. We can't afford to eat anything except beans. That is, our housing has become a commodity. And it takes a little bit of nerve to dive into those primal, terrifying parts of ourselves and make our own decisions and not make our housing a commodity, but make it something that bubbles up from seminal sources. That takes a little bit of nerve. And darn it, once in a while you fail. But that's okay. If failure destroys you, then you can't do this. I fail all the time, every day. And I've had some whopping failures, I promise, where big, public, humiliating, embarrassing failures. Everybody points and laughs, and he says, he tried it a fifth time, and it still didn't work. What a moron. Early on, contractors come by and say, Dan, you're a cute little bunny, but, you know, this just isn't going to work. Why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? And your instinct is to say, well, why don't you suck an egg? <laughs> but you don't say that because they're the guys you're targeting. And so what we've done, and this isn't just in housing, it's clothing and food and our transportation needs, our energy, we sprawl just a little bit. And when I get a little bit of uh, press, I hear from people all over the world. And we may have invented excess, but the problem of waste is worldwide. We are, ha we, we're in trouble. And I don't wear ammo belts crisscrossing my chest and a red bandana, but we're clearly in trouble. And 
what we need to do is reconnect with those really primal parts of ourselves and make some decisions and say, you know, I think I would like to put CDs across the wall there. What do you think, honey? If it doesn't work, take it down. What we need to do is reconnect with who we really are. And that's thrilling indeed. Thank you very much. So imagine, you're in the supermarket, you're buying some groceries, and you get given the option for a plastic or a paper shopping bag. Which one do you choose if you want to do the right thing by the environment? Most people do pick the paper. Uh, okay, let's think of why. It's brown to start with, therefore it must be good for the environment. It's biodegradable, it's reusable in some cases, it's recyclable. So when people are looking at the plastic bag, it's likely they're thinking of something like this, which we all know is absolutely terrible and we should be avoiding at all expenses these kinds of environmental damages. But people are often not thinking of something like this, which is the other end of the spectrum. When we produce materials, we need to extract them from the environment and we need to a whole bunch of environmental impacts. You see... What happens is when we need to make complex choices, us humans like really simple solutions, and so we often ask for simple solutions. And I work in design, uh, I advise designers and, and innovators around sustainability, and everyone always says to me, oh, Layla, I just want the eco-materials. And I say, well, that's very complex, and we'll have to spend four hours talking about what exactly an eco-material means, because everything at some point comes from nature. And it's how you use the material that dictates the environmental impact. So what happens is we have to rely on some sort of intuitive framework when we make decisions. So I like to call that intuitive framework our environmental folklore. Okay, it's either the little voice at the back of your head uh, or it's that gut feeling you get when you've done the right thing. So when you've picked the paper bag or when you've bought a fuel-efficient car, and environmental folklore is a really important thing because we're trying to do the right thing. But how do we know if we're actually reducing the net environmental impacts that our actions as individuals and as professionals and as a society are actually having on the natural environment? So the thing about environmental folklore is it tends to be based on our experiences, the things we've heard from other people. It doesn't tend to be based on any scientific framework. And this is really hard because we live in incredibly complex systems. We have the human systems of how we communicate and interrelate and have our whole constructed society, of the industrial systems, which is essentially the entire economy. And then all of that has to operate within the biggest system and I would argue the most important, uh, the ecosystem. And you see, the choices that we make as an individual, but the choices that we make in every single job that we have, no matter how high or low you are in the pecking order, has an impact on all of these systems. And the thing is, is that we have to find ways, if we're actually going to address sustainability, of interlocking those complex systems and making better choices that result in net environmental gains. What we need to do is we need to learn to do more with less. We have an increasing population and everybody likes their mobile phones, especially in this situation here. So we need to find innovative ways of solving some of these problems that we face. And that's where this process called life cycle thinking comes in. So essentially, everything that is created goes through a series of life cycle stages. And we use this scientific process called life cycle assessment, or in America you guys say life cycle analysis, um, in order to have a clearer picture of how everything that we do in the technical part of those systems affects 
the natural environment. So we go all the way back to the extraction of raw materials. And then we look at manufacturing. We look at packaging and transportation, use and end of life. And at every single one of these stages, the things that we do have an interaction with the natural environment. And we can monitor how that interaction is actually affecting the systems and services that make life on Earth possible. And through doing this, we've learned some absolutely fascinating things. And we've busted a bunch of myths. So, to start with, there's a word that's used a lot. Um, it's used a lot in marketing, and it's used a lot, I think, in our conversation when we're talking about sustainability. And that's the word biodegradability. Now, biodegradability is a material property. It is not a definition of environmental benefit. Allow me to explain. When something natural, something that's made from a cellulose fibre, like you know, a piece of bread even, or any food waste, or even a piece of paper, when something natural ends up in the natural environment, it degrades normally. It's little carbon molecules that it stored up as it was growing and naturally released back into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. But this is a net situation. Most natural things don't actually end up in nature. Most of the things, the waste that we produce, end up in landfill. Landfill is a different environment. In landfill, those same carbon molecules degrade in a different way because a landfill is anaerobic. It's got no oxygen. It's, it's tightly compacted and hot. Those same molecules, they become methane. And methane is a 25 times more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So our old lettuces and products that we have thrown out that are made out of biodegradable materials, if they end up in landfill, contribute to climate change. You see, there are facilities now that can actually capture that methane and generate power, displacing the need for fossil fuel power. But we need to be smart about this. We need to identify how we can start to leverage these types of things that are already happening and start to design systems and services that alleviate these problems. Because right now, what people do is they turn around and they say, let's ban paper, uh, plastic bags, we'll give people paper because that is better for the environment. But if you're throwing it in the bin and your local landfill facility is just a normal one, then we're having what's called a double negative. Okay, I, I also, I'm a product designer by trade, then did social science, and so I'm absolutely fascinated by consumer goods and how the consumer goods that we have kind of become immune to that fill our lives have an impact on the natural environment. And these guys are like serial offenders. And I'm pretty sure everyone in this room has a refrigerator. Now, America has this amazing ability to keep growing refrigerators. <laughs> in the last few years, they've grown one cubic foot on average, the standard size of a refrigerator. And uh, the problem is, is they're so big now, it's easier for us to buy more food that we can't eat or find. I mean, I have things at the back of my refrigerator that have been there for years, <laughs> right? And so what happens is we waste more food. And as I was just explaining, food waste is a problem. In fact, here in the US, food waste, 40% of food purchased for the home is wasted. Half of the world's produced food is wasted. That's the latest UN stats. Up to half of the food. It's insane. It's 1.3 billion tonnes of food per annum. And I blame it on the refrigerator, well, especially in Western cultures, because it makes it easier. I mean, there's a lot of complex systems going on here. I don't want to, you know, make it so simplistic, but the refrigerator is a serious contributor to this. And one of the features of it is the crisper drawer. You all got crisper drawers? You know the drawer that you put your lettuces in? Lettuces have a habit of going soggy in the crisper drawers, don't they? Yeah? Soggy lettuces? In the UK, this is such a problem that there was a government report a few years ago that actually said the second biggest offender of wasted food in the UK is the soggy lettuce. It was called the soggy lettuce report. Okay? So this is a problem, people. These poor little lettuces are getting thrown out left, right and centre because the crisper drawers are not designed to actually keep things crisp. Okay, you need, you need a tight environment. You need like an airless environment to prevent the degrading that would happen naturally. But the crisper drawers, they're just a drawer with like a slightly better seal. Anyway, I, clearly obsessed, all right? Don't ever invite me over because I'll just start going through your refrigerator and looking at all sorts of things like that. But essentially, this is a big problem because when we lose something like the lettuce from the system, not only do we have that impact I just explained at the end of life, but we actually have had to grow that lettuce. The life cycle impact of that lettuce is astronomical. We've had to clear land. We've had to plant seeds, phosphorus, 
fertilizers, nutrients, water, sunlight, all of the embodied impacts in that lettuce get lost from the system, which makes it a far bigger environmental impact than the loss of the energy from the fridge. So we need to design things like this far better if we're going to start addressing serious environmental problems. We could start with the crisper drawer and the size. For those of you in the room who do design fridges, that would be great. Okay, so the problem is, so imagine if we actually started to reconsider how we designed things. So I, I look at the refrigerator as a thing that, it's like a, a sign of modernity, but we actually haven't really changed the design of them that much since the 1950s, a little bit. But um, essentially, they're still big boxes, that, cold boxes that we store stuff in. So imagine if we actually really started to identify these problems and use that as the foundation for finding innovative and elegant design solutions that'll solve those problems. This is design-led system change. Design dictating the way in which the system can be far more sustainable. 40% food waste is a major problem. Imagine if we designed fridges that halved that. Another item that I find fascinating is the electric tea kettle, which I found out that you guys don't really, you don't do tea kettles in this country really, do you? but that's really big in the UK. 97% of households in the United Kingdom own an electric tea kettle. So they're very popular. And I mean, if I were to work with a design firm or a designer and they were designing one of these and they wanted to do it eco, they'd usually say, they'd ask me two things. They'd say, Layla, how do I make it technically efficient? Because obviously energy is a problem with this product. Or how do I make it green materials? How do I, how do I make the materials green? in the manufacturing. Would, would you ask me those questions? They seem logical, right? Yeah. Well, I'd say you know, you're looking at the wrong problems because the problem is with use. It's with how people use the product. 65% of Brits admit to overfilling their kettle when they only need one cup of tea. All of this extra water that's being boiled requires energy. And it's been calculated that in one day of extra energy use from boiling kettles is enough to light all of the street lights in England for a night. But this is the thing, right? This is what I call a product person failure, but we've got a product system failure going on with these little guys. And they're so ubiquitous, you know, you don't even notice they're there. And uh, this guy over here, though, he does. His name's Simon. Simon works for the National Electricity Company in the UK. He has a very important job of monitoring all of the electricity coming into the system to make sure there is enough so it powers everybody's homes. He's also watching television. The reason is, is because there's a unique phenomenon that happens in the UK the moment that very popular TV shows end. The minute the ad break comes on, this man has to rush to buy nuclear power from France because everybody turns their kettles on at the same time. <laughs> 1.5 million kettles, seriously problematic. So imagine if you designed kettles, you actually found a way to solve these system failures because this is a huge amount of pressure on the system just because the product hasn't thought about the problem that it's going to have when it exists in the world. Now, I looked at a number of kettles available on the market and found the minimum fill line, so the little piece of information that tells you how much you need to put in there, was between two and five and a half cups of water just to make one cup of tea. So this kettle here is an example of one where it actually has two boiling chambers, or sorry, two reservoirs. One's a boiling chamber and one's the water holder. The user actually has to push that button to get their hot water boiled, which means, because we're all lazy, you only fill exactly what you need. And this is what I call behaviour-changing products. Products, systems or services that intervene and solve these problems up front. Now, this is, this is a technology arena, so obviously these things are quite popular. Um, but I think if we're going to keep uh, buying, designing, buying and using and throwing out these kinds of products at the rate we currently do, which is astronomically high, there are 7 billion people, right, who live in the world right now. There are 6 billion mobile phone subscriptions as of last year. Every single year, 1.5 billion mobile phones roll off production lines, and some companies report their production rate as being greater than the human birth rate. 152 million phones were thrown out in the US last year, only 11% were recycled. I'm from Australia, we have a population of 22 million, don't laugh, and it's been reported that 22 million phones are in people's drawers. 
We need to find ways of solving the problems around this because these things are so complicated. They have so much locked up inside them. Gold, did you know that it's actually cheaper now to get gold out of a ton of old mobile phones than it is out of a ton of gold ore? There's a number of highly complex and valuable materials embodied inside these things. So we need to find ways of encouraging disassembly because this is otherwise what happens. This is a community in Ghana, and e-waste is reported, or electronic waste is reported by the UN as being up to 50 million tonnes trafficked. This is how they get the gold and the other valuable materials out. They burn the electronic waste in open spaces. These are communities, and this is happening all over the world. And because we don't see the ramifications of the choices that we make as designers, as business people, as consumers, then these kinds of externalities happen, and these are people's lives. So we need to find smarter, more systems-based, innovative solutions to these problems if we're going to start to live sustainably within this world. So imagine if when you bought your mobile phone, your new one, because you replaced your old one, after 15 to 18 months is the average time that people replace their phones, by the way. So if we're going to keep this kind of expedient uh, mobile phone replacing, then we should be looking at closing the loop on these systems. The people who produce these phones, and some of which I'm sure are in the room right now, could potentially look at doing what we call closed-loop systems or product system services. So identifying that there is a market demand and that market demand is not going to go anywhere, so you design the product to solve the problem, design for disassembly, design for lightweighting. We heard some, some of those kinds of strategies being used in the Tesla Motors car today. These kinds of approaches are not hard, but understanding the system and then looking for viable, market-driven, consumer demand alternatives is how we can start radically altering the sustainability agenda. Because I hate to break it to you all, consumption is the biggest problem. But design is one of the best solutions. These kinds of products are everywhere. By identifying alternative ways of doing things, we can actually start to innovate. And I say actually start to innovate, I'm sure everyone in this room is very innovative, um, but in the regards to using sustainability as a parameter, as a criteria for fueling systems-based solutions. Because as I've just demonstrated with these simple products, they're participating in these major problems. So we need to look across the entire life of the things that we do. If you just had paper or plastic, obviously reusable is far more beneficial, then the paper is worse. And the paper is worse because it weighs four to ten times more than the plastic. And when we actually compare from a life cycle perspective a kilo of plastic and a kilo of paper, the paper is far better. But the functionality of a plastic or a paper bag to carry your groceries home is not done with a kilo of each material. It's done with a very small amount of plastic and quite a lot more paper because functionality defines environmental impact. And I said earlier that the designers always ask me for the eco-materials. I say, you know, there's only a few materials that you should completely avoid. The rest of them, it's all about application. And at the end of the day, everything we design and produce in the economy or buy as consumers is done so for function. We want something, therefore we buy it. So breaking things back down and delivering smartly, elegantly, sophisticated solutions that take into consideration the entire system and the entire life of the thing, everything, back all the way back to the extraction through to the end of life, we can start to actually find really innovative solutions. And I'll just leave you with one very quick thing that a, a designer said to me recently, who I work with, a senior designer, I said, how come you're not doing sustainability? You know, I know you know this. And he said, well, recently I pitched a sustainability project to a client and he turned to her and said to me, I know it's going to cost less. I know it's going to sell more. But we're not pioneers because pioneers have arrows in their backs. I think we've got a room full of pioneers and I hope there are far more pioneers out there because we need to solve these problems. Thank you.
Everything is covered in invisible ecosystems made of tiny life forms, bacteria, viruses, and fungi. Our desks, our computers, our pencils, our buildings all harbor resident microbial landscapes. As we design these things, we could be thinking about designing these invisible worlds and also thinking about how they interact with our personal ecosystems. Our bodies are home to trillions of microbes, and these creatures define who we are. The microbes in your gut can influence your weight and your moods. The microbes on your skin can help boost your immune system. The microbes in your mouth can freshen your breath, or not. And the key thing is that our personal ecosystems interact with ecosystems on everything we touch. So, for example, when you touch a pencil, microbial exchange happens. If we can design the invisible ecosystems in our surroundings, this opens a path to influencing our health in unprecedented ways. I get asked all of the time from people, is it possible to really design microbial ecosystems? And I believe the answer is yes. I think we're doing it right now, but we're doing it unconsciously. I'm going to share data with you from one aspect of my research focused on architecture that demonstrates how, through both conscious and unconscious design, we're impacting these invisible worlds. This is the Lillis Business Complex at the University of Oregon, and I worked with a team of architects and biologists to sample over 300 rooms in this building. We wanted to get something like a fossil record of the building, and to do this, we sampled dust. From the dust, we pulled out bacterial cells, broke them open, and compared their gene sequences. This means that people in my group were doing a lot of vacuuming during this project. This is a picture of Tim, who, right when I snapped this picture, reminded me, he said, Jessica, the last lab group I worked in, I was doing field work in the Costa Rican rainforests, and things have changed dramatically for me. <laughs> so I'm going to show you now first what we found in the offices, and we're going to look at the data through a visualization tool that I've been working on in partnership with Autodesk. The way that you look at this data is first look around the outside of the circle, you'll see broad bacterial groups. And if you look at the shape of this pink lobe, it tells you something about the relative abundance of each group. So at 12 o'clock, you'll see that offices have a lot of alpha proteobacteria, and at 1 o'clock, you'll see that bacilli are relatively rare. Let's take a look at what's going on in different space types in this building. If you look inside the restrooms, they all have really similar ecosystems. And if you were to look inside the classrooms, those also have similar ecosystems. But if you look across these space types, you can see that they're fundamentally different from one another. I like to think of bathrooms like a tropical rainforest. I told Tim, if you could just see the microbes, it's kind of like being in Costa Rica, kind of. <laughs> And I also like to think of offices as being a temperate grassland. This perspective is a really powerful one for designers because you can bring on principles of ecology. And a really important principle of ecology is dispersal, um, the way organisms move around. We know that microbes are dispersed around by people and by air. So the very first thing we wanted to do in this building was look at the air system. Mechanical engineers design air handling units to make sure that people are comfortable, that the airflow and temperature is just right. They do this using principles of physics and chemistry, but they could also be using biology. If you look at the microbes in one of the air handling units in this building, you'll see that they're all very similar to one another. And if you compare this to the microbes in a different air handling unit, you'll see that they're fundamentally different. The rooms in this building are like islands in an archipelago, and what that means is that mechanical engineers are like eco-engineers, and they have the ability to structure biomes in this building the way that they want to. Another facet of how microbes get around is by people, and designers often cluster rooms together to facilitate interactions among people or the sharing of ideas, like in labs and in offices. 
Given that microbes travel around with people, you might expect to see rooms that are close together have really similar biomes. And that is exactly what we found. If you look at classrooms right adjacent to one another, they have very similar ecosystems. But if you go to a class, um, sorry, an office that is a farther walking distance away, the ecosystem is fundamentally different. And when I see the power that dispersal has on these biogeographic patterns, it makes me think that it's possible to tackle really challenging problems like hospital-acquired infections. I believe this has got to be, in part, a building ecology problem. All right, I'm going to tell you one more story about this building. I am collaborating with Charlie Brown. He's an architect, and Charlie is deeply concerned about global climate change. He's dedicated his life to sustainable design. When he met me and realized that it was possible for him to study in a quantitative way how his design choices impacted the ecology and biology of this building, he got really excited because it added a new dimension to what he did. He went from thinking just about energy to also starting to think about human health. He helped design some of the air handling systems in this building and the way it was ventilated. So what I'm first going to show you is air that we sampled outside of the building. What you're looking at is a signature of bacterial communities in the outdoor air and how they vary over time. Next, I'm going to show you what happened when we experimentally manipulated classrooms. We blocked them off at night so that they got no ventilation. A lot of buildings are operated this way, probably where you work, and companies do this to save money on their energy bill. What we found is that these rooms remained relatively stagnant until Saturday when we opened the vents up again. When you walked into those rooms, they smelled really bad, and our data suggests that it had something to do with leaving behind the airborne bacterial soup from people the day before. Contrast this to rooms that were designed using a sustainable passive design strategy where air came in from the outside through louvers. In these rooms, the air tracked the outdoor air relatively well, and when Charlie saw this, he got really excited. He felt like he had made a good choice with the design process because it was both energy efficient and it washed away the building's resident microbial landscape. The examples that I just gave you are about architecture, but they're relevant to the design of anything. Imagine designing with the kinds of microbes that we want in a plane or in a, on a phone. There's a new microbe, I just discovered it, it's called Bliss, and it's been shown to both ward off pathogens and give you good breath. Wouldn't it be awesome if we all had Bliss on our phones? A conscious approach to design, I'm calling it bio-informed design, and I think it's possible. Thank you. Humans in the developed world spend more than 90% of their lives indoors, where they breathe in and come into contact with trillions of life forms invisible to the naked eye, microorganisms. Buildings are complex ecosystems that are an important source of microbes that are good for us and some that are bad for us. What determines the types and distributions of microbes indoors? Buildings are colonized by airborne microbes that enter through windows and through mechanical ventilation systems, and they are brought inside by humans and other creatures. The fate of microbes indoors depends on complex interactions with humans and with the human-built environment. And today, architects and biologists are working together 
to explore smart building design that will create healthy buildings for us. We spend an extraordinary amount of time in buildings that are extremely controlled environments, like this building here. Environments that have mechanical ventilation systems that include filtering, heating, and air conditioning. Given the amount of time that we spend indoors, it's important to understand how this affects our health. At the Biology and Built Environment Center, we carried out a study in a hospital where we sampled air and pulled the DNA out of microbes in the air, and we looked at three different types of rooms. We looked at rooms that were mechanically ventilated, which are the data points in the blue. We looked at rooms that were naturally ventilated, where the hospital let us turn off the mechanical ventilation in a wing of the building and pry open the windows that were no longer operable, but they made them operable for our study, and we also sampled the outdoor air. If you look at the x-axis of this graph, you'll see that what we commonly want to do, which is keeping the outdoors out, we accomplish that with mechanical ventilation. So if you look at the green data points, which is air that's outside, you'll see that there's a large amount of microbial diversity or variety of microbial types. But if you look at the blue data points, which is mechanically ventilated air, it's not as diverse. But being less diverse is not necessarily good for our health. If you look at the y-axis of this graph, you'll see that in the mechanically ventilated air, you have a higher probability of encountering a potential pathogen or germ than if you're outdoors. So to understand why this was the case, we took our data and put it into an ordination diagram, which is a statistical map that tells you something about how related the microbial communities are in the different samples. The data points that are closer together have microbial communities that are more similar than data points that are far apart. And the first thing that you can see from this graph is if you look at the blue data points, which are the mechanically ventilated air, they're not simply a subset of the green data points, which are the outdoor air. What we found is that mechanically ventilated air looks like humans. It has microbes on it that are commonly associated with our skin and with our mouth, our spit. And this is because we are all constantly shedding microbes. So all of you right now are sharing your microbes with one another. And when you're outdoors, that type of air has microbes that are commonly associated with plant leaves and with dirt. Why does this matter? It matters because the healthcare industry is the second most energy intensive industry in the United States. Hospitals use two and a half times the amount of energy as office buildings. And the model that we're working with in hospitals and also with many, many different buildings